guys, welcome back to the Box 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 Challenge. It's been a while since I've done this. I think I've, the last time I did this was Australia, uh, which is quite a while back. It's been like, what, a month or two? Maybe? I'm not entirely sure. But welcome back. Uh, it's been a while, it's been a while. Uh, some things have happened, some things have not happened. The reason why I haven't done this in a while is because there's been a lot of mid kind of races. There's not been much action. Uh, but these two that I'm going to mention did include a bit of action and a bit of an update on the title fight. Uh, today we're going through Baku and Canada. Now I was only meant to do like a separate episode for Baku, a separate episode for Canada. However, because of my tiny, tiny break, I decided to do Baku and Canada together. I just sort of extend this episode really. So... What actually happened? We're going to talk about Baku first because Baku happened before Canada and vice versa. So what happened in Baku? Not a lot happened in practice as always. However, we did see a bit of a showdown between Perez and Leclerc for the fastest car in practice. Perez topped FP1 and FP3 and Charles Leclerc topped FP2, which does prove the question, is Perez fast? In terms of practice sessions, can he improve his pace? I believe he could. If he wasn't given team orders, like he was in Baku, we'll get onto that shortly. If he isn't given team orders, he is probably the fastest driver on the grid. He can perform, he can win races. We've seen that in the past, like Sakir and Baku last year. We do know how fast Perez is in terms of pace. We've seen what he can do in Sakir. We've seen what he can do in Baku last year. We saw what he did in Monaco. Uh, just uh, last month, in fact, or earlier this month, we do know that Perez is a good driver. Is he fast for Red Bull? Absolutely. Does he need to stop at the team orders? Absolutely, he does. Because the team orders will get you nowhere. It got Bottas nowhere in Mercedes. Bottas kept on like obeying team orders to Hamilton, and he, the reason why he's not world champion is because of those team orders. If it's not for team orders early in the season, we wouldn't be getting a very close title fight between probably three, maybe four uh, drivers, between the two drivers of Red Bull and the two drivers of Ferrari. But, you know, we're not here to talk about practice, we're here to talk about like qualifying and race also. Let's get on to qualifying. It was a very good qualifying session. Um, again, not a lot happened, although it was quite, quite decent. We did see a few incidents here and there. We saw Stroll crash out at Q1 and was eliminated from there. We saw other drivers uh, going to wall, but it was Charles Leclerc who got pole position in Baku and thus solidified his spot in P1 on the grid for the race. Again, not a lot happened in qualifying, so we're just going to move on to the race. It was a decent race. Not a lot happened within the first maybe four or five laps. Then we got onto lap nine, and sadly another engine failure for Carlos Sainz. <laughs> They, this dude cannot escape bad luck, as long as he's concerned. But yeah, Sainz did suffer what seemed, what he seemed was a brake by wire failure. Turns out it was a issue with his hydraulics because you can hear it in his car at the time when he was braking for the corner. You can see how bad his engine sounded once he pulled up because of the hydraulics. And thus Sainz was forced into retirement uh, early on before 10 laps in Baku. Science is not having the best of seasons, although I'm still not giving hope. You know, he, he is still a smooth operator. He just needs that reliability to just kick in and just do his job. And Science will be up there on the top step of the podium soon enough in the season. Hopefully, fingers crossed, Dave. Again, not a lot happened in the race, but we do suffer a major shock retirement in the form of Charles Leclerc. In the other Ferrari. Ferrari suffer a double DNF in Baku. Signs with a hydraulic problem. Charles Leclerc a major gearbox problem we believe. Because of the engine pouring out of his car. I was shocked to see Leclerc retire from this race. I'm going to be honest. I completely missed this race. Because I was. I didn't even know Baku was on early. I, I overslept. Uh. Believe me, I overslept. I didn't know Baku was on early. Baku finished as soon as I woke up and I heard about Leclerc's retirement and Sainz's retirement and Rebel dominating the race. That's it. Rebel won thanks to Verstappen. Well, thanks to Perez, actually, for obeying team orders. Yes, Perez had to obey team orders again. 
I believe Verstappen and Perez is the new Hamilton and Bottas. You know, don't quote me on that. But Verstappen did use Perez. I'm going to say use on this. I, I didn't want to sound too harsh. But I have to be honest with myself and say Perez was used in Verstappen's triumph in Baku. Verstappen crossed the line in first place with Perez in second and George Russell in third. Now, I have a bit of an issue with the Mercedes because Mercedes are not looking like the dominant team they have been for the past five, six, maybe seven seasons in Formula 1. We've established Mercedes as one of the most dominant F1 teams in the hybrid era. We've seen what they can do. We've seen what Hamilton can do. We've seen what Bottas can do. We see what Russell can do now. Mr. Consistency. Every race he's done in, he's finished in the top five. We see how we do in the constructors, how they work well as a team. Is the reliability issues affecting Mercedes? Yes, it is. Mercedes having a really bad issue with reliability here. And I don't want to, you know, trigger some Mercedes fans who are saying... Oh, well, it's just a run of bad luck. You know, Ferrari have had it, Red Bull have had it, McLaren have had it. It happens with all the teams. Mercedes have established themselves as, like I said, the most dominating team in the hybrid era. We see how they do for the last five, six, maybe seven seasons. We know what they are capable of. Reliability issues are not in Mercedes' favour, unfortunately. And with Hamilton not performing the way he should be, with Russell kind of pulling Mercedes weight with these consistent finishes. The, these races that Russell is competing in, for every race he's competed in this season, he's finished in the top five. Every single one of them. You you can name uh, Bahrain. You can name Jeddah. You can name Imola. You can do Australia. Maybe Monaco even. Every race that Russell has competed in, he has finished in the top five. He hasn't had a single DNF this season. Could it change? It will do. It's Formula 1. It's cruel sometimes we know what that's like we'll get onto that afterwards when we talk about Canada but the issue I have with Mercedes is is that the reliability that they have this season is stopping them from doing what they want to do I see these debriefs that Mercedes do all the time after a race weekend and you see the strategies they make you see the race pace it's not competitive enough do I see Mercedes as title challengers next season Possibly, but if they don't get their reliability sorted, it will seem like Ferrari from the last two seasons. Reliability will cost them not just track positions, but will also cost them races as well. We saw Hamilton in Spain. He almost wanted to retire from the race because of how unreliable the car was. Like, porpoising effect as well it is not very good with Mercedes right now. Mercedes is a real tiger with porpoising right now. Of course, other teams are struggling with it. But Mercedes are the real strugglers with Porpoison. They are bouncing left, right and centre. And we know what they are. We know how bad Mercedes are with Porpoison. We know how bad they are with unreliability issues. Struggle to get that out then. But the problem that Mercedes have right now is that without a competitive car this season, is it time for them to focus on next season's car? Or should they focus on this season's car as well as next season's car, just to get them more competitive as the races develop, and just to get them more competitive for next season, in order for them to maintain a challenge for a Constructors' Championship. They're nowhere near the Drivers' Championship. They're nowhere near the Constructors' Championship. Is it time for Mercedes to move on? Possibly is. I want, to, I want you guys to let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Is it time for Mercedes to move on and focus on next season's car, or should they stick with this season finish this season, and then move on to next season. Who knows? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. That was it for Baku. We saw Verstappen win the race. We saw Perez in second. We saw Russell in third. A very good display from Red Bull. And Verstappen further solidifies his status in the driver standards right now. Further extends his lead over possibly a stricken Leclerc at the minute with how Baku went. Now we move on to Canada. Like I said, I was meant to do a separate episode for Baku and Canada. Just decided to do them together. Whatever, you're going to live with it. There was not a lot to talk about in practice again. There were a few issues here, there and everywhere. We saw Alonso top the final practice three uh, standings because of how wet the track was. It, was. it was dry the first two sessions and then FP3 came and it started pouring it down. So we knew how qualifying was going to... Be. We knew how badly the cars were going to be effective, uh, affected. 
especially with like Mercedes or maybe Ferrari. Leclerc, before qualifying, put a new power unit into his gearbox, put a new power component into his car, which meant he was sent to the back of the grid. He was initially given a 10 place grid penalty because he changed a couple of parts here, there and everywhere, but then decided to change the full power component just in case another further retirement would, you know, occur similar to Baku, which turned to the back of the grid. Now, I'm not one. I'm not one for complaining in terms of power unit, but if a certain car, I, I believe the rules may have been switched up for this season. I'm not entirely sure. All I know is, if a car suffers retirement from a Grand Prix, it should be eligible to change the whole power component without suffering a grid penalty. We've seen back in 2018, Dana Ricciardo was so unreliable with the Red Bull. The Red Bull was so unreliable for him. He suffered multiple DNFs. I think he had more DNFs uh, for the 2018 season than more drivers as, as any other driver. He had more DNFs in that season than any other driver. And that's because how unreliable the other Red Bull was compared to Verstappen's uh, Red Bull. But every time Ricardo switched his power component, he never faced a grid penalty. Or at least I don't think so. With Leclerc, that should stay. Leclerc should never face a grid penalty for changing a power component should he suffer retirement. It's the same with Sainz. Sainz never had a grid penalty, but he should but he should never have a grid penalty if you're suffering an uh, engine failure. Should be the same for all the other teams like Mercedes or Alpine or McLaren. If they suffer a engine issue or a mechanical failure that forces them into retirement from the race, that forces them into a DNF for the race, they should not be given a grid penalty for judging a power component. It's as simple as that. You're not going to make any sense if you're saying, well, they just had an early retirement. They'll change their power component. We'll give them a 20 plus grid penalty. We'll drop them back to the grid. You know, uh, screw them. It's not like that. You know, Leclerc's penalty was a bit unfair and he was sent to the back of the grid, which meant more advantage for Red Bull. As far as Max and Christian Horner is concerned. Perez I'm not entirely sure about. But Max and Christian Horner will definitely find Leclerc's penalty a bit of an advantage for them. In terms of not only championship standings but also the race itself. Because it gives Verstappen uh, less of a threat. We were treated to an absolute classic of a qualifying. Qualifying 1 and qualifying 2 were that bad. We had a few retirements in the form of like Sonoda and... Bottas was eliminated in Q2, but his teammate Joe Guan Yu made it to Q3. However, we were treated to an absolute classic of a Q3 because Verstappen got pole position, obviously. With Leclerc's penalty, he was sent to the back of the grid for that, obviously. But Fernando Alonso, El Plan. We knew how trendy El Plan was in terms of the Qatar Grand Prix because Fernando got a podium. Fernando qualified front of the grid for the first time in years i believe so like last time he qualified for front of the grid was back in his ferrari days which was like 2010 2015 like from that time but alonso front of the grid with verstappen it did provide me with a bit of a delusion that maybe fernando might win the canadian grand prix we can only hope we can only hope for so much excitement in formula one that sometime that somehow an alpine again would win a race like ocon did in hungary last year but it wasn't meant to be, and Alonso fell P7 by the end of the first lap. Verstappen was leading the race, and Alonso fell back. It was it was a dry race, so obviously Alpine weren't meant to get their reliability issues sorted for a dry race. They had the wet race sorted, or wet qualifying, sorry. They had a wet qualifying sorted, not a dry race. Uh, so, sad times for L plan. It was L not so good plan. Or something like that. I don't know. But the race itself wasn't that bad. We had another unreliability issue. In terms of Sergio Perez. Who retired on lap 9. Similar to Carlos Sainz. Uh, Perez had an engine failure. And sadly we had another engine failure. In terms of Mick Schumacher. Oh boy. The two Haas's were in Q3. Both Kevin and Mick were in Q3. For Haas. And I was really excited to see Mick. Possibly finally getting his first points in Formula 1. But sadly, it wasn't meant to be as Schumacher also pulled out at the same corner as Paris. Just a few laps later from an engine failure. Sadly, again, Formula 1 is so cruel it's like that. Now, I don't have a bone to pick with Haas. I think Haas have got the reliability issues 
kind of sorted. They need a few more uh, tweaks. They need to still get a few more bugs out of the system. But Haas are looking pretty good uh, this season. Now, not a lot happened in the race. It was quite, it was quite a decent race, not a boring race. I'd, I'd say it's more entertaining than possibly Spain, maybe. Um, I mean, Barcelona is quite boring, but Canada can produce a bit of boring races, but not a lot of boring races. But it was quite more, it was more thrilling than Spain, trust me. It was all going so well, and then we had a yellow flag in the probably the final stages of the race where Yuki Tsunoda went off, possibly mirroring Yano Trulli back in the day, where Tsunoda had left the pits and then his front right tyre locked up and he crashed into the barriers. Um, again, similar to Yano Trulli back in 2007, I think it was, or 2006, I don't know, I saw it earlier that Trulli had done the same as Tsunoda or Tsunoda had done the same as Trulli, I just can't remember what year Trulli did it in. But Sonoda kind of mirrored Yano Trulli by crashing into the barriers and thus bringing out a VSC. So it wasn't the best day for Alfa Tauri. It was possibly the rest, the best day for Red Bull because Verstappen crossed the line again in P1, which again further extends his lead on the championship and further solidifies Ferrari's status okay, of Okay, they need to get back here. We need to get back. We need to get Charles back competing for the title. We need Charles competing for the title again. And we need to sort out our reliability issues again. So that's it for the races. It was it was a decent race for Baku, decent race for Canada. I'm not going to complain too much. I like decent races. I don't like boring races. I like decent races and good races. And then I could do these. That's why I haven't done it since Australia. Because I've been loads of uh, not so good races. But, you know, that's it for back in Canada. Now, I did get questions. I got one for each uh, Grand Prix, which, again, isn't good. I'm hoping for more questions. Come on, please. We did get more questions for my Round the Outside uh, segment, which is where I ask you guys for questions for my post-race show. And they both came from the same person, starting with, or not starting with, uh, Dave asked a question for both Baku and Canada. His question for Baku was uh, your thoughts on McLaren and Danny Rick. I didn't mention McLaren and Danny Rick. Damn. McLaren had a very decent race uh, in Baku. Not so for Canada, but decent for Baku. They finished, They both finished in the points. I believe this was probably Ricardo's best race. Uh, it was a quiet one for McLaren, but I believe this was probably McLaren's best race. Uh, sorry, Ricardo's best race um, since his win in Monza. McLaren haven't been that competitive since Monza. And the uh, reliability issues this season have put a little downer on the season for, uh, for the team from Woking. But Ricardo was very good with his performance. I think he had like a little issue with the, with the team orders. They said, if we want you to stay behind uh, Norris so that pressure doesn't build to him so that, because he's the faster car. And then he said something like, if I stay behind Norris, then I'm going to get eaten up by Gasly. Because Gasly was right behind him. Which I respect that. I respect that. It makes the team think more about strategies. And it makes the team think about a different alternative option. To like, okay, we don't want Gasly to overtake us. What can we do to improve that? And it gets the team thinking again. And it gets them working again. And it makes them develop a different strategy. So that the team... So that the teams that they're competing with. Like Alpha Tauri and Gasly. Can not expect that from the team. And then sort of get them competing again. It's that competitiveness of the midfield teams that I like. So I think McLaren and Danny Rick had a very good race. Same as Norris. Uh, it was quite a quiet one, but quite decent. Uh, we also had uh, another question from Dave at uh, Canada. Your thoughts on Ferrari and Carlos Sainz? Now, we did mention that Sainz had a bit of an unreliability issue in Baku. He had no reliability issues in Canada. Thank God he got a podium. I'm sorry, I'm getting, I don't know why I'm getting emotional for us. But Sainz finished uh, second in Canada. I forgot to mention, um, it was Verstappen first, Sainz second, and Hamilton third. Hamilton finally got a podium for the first time since uh, Bahrain. His second podium of the season, and Sainz got another podium as well. Uh, thank God for uh, reliability issues. Leclerc did well, uh, got back to P6, I believe, which is very good for him in terms of uh, constructors for Ferrari. 
but Verstappen again seals the day. It doubled the light for Verstappen. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, Ferrari got the strategy spot on with Carlos Sainz, and I believe uh, Sainz had a very good race. He was so close to getting his first win as well. I was cheering him on like crazy. Uh, kept on repeating, come on, Carlos, come on, Sainz. You know, whatever. And sadly, he didn't get the win. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy for the guy. You know, he deserves a podium after all of his uh, unreliability issues this season. So, uh, yeah, just great he got the podium. And that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching the Box 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 show. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope you guys can stick around for the next episode, which will be Silverstone in a week on Sunday. So I, I, will, I will be watching it live. It's the only race I get to see live, but I will be doing like post race reaction. I will not be doing the live stream because my dad also wants to go see a race and he hates distractions. He hates me talking during races. So um, yeah, uh, I will. I will be watching the race live and I will be offering my post race uh, thoughts again on Tuesday. Uh, this is actually Thursday I'm doing this. I really do apologize. Uh, it's Thursday I'm doing this, but my Silverstone post race reactions will be done uh, the Tuesday after the race. So, there you go. So, I hope you guys can stick around for that. And, uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. If you did the, like this video, please hit the like button. If you guys want to see more, please subscribe to the channel. We're almost at 300 subscribers. Please, guys, let's hit it by the end of the year. We should do that. Uh, if you guys dislike it, then feel free to dislike. I don't care whatsoever. And let me know your comments below on Mercedes's, Mercedes's uh, unreliability issues and also your questions for Silverstone. After it happens, uh, I'll also be doing it on Twitter and Instagram, so make sure you follow me on there as well. But until then, guys, thank you guys so much for watching the video. I've been TV. you guys have been my viewers, and I'll see you guys for another episode.